Okay, so we are officially starting. Uh, I want to, I am the uh, co-founder, creative director of Radical Books Collective. Very honored and excited to uh, listen in to this conversation. And, and I also want to welcome all the people. We have a record amount of registrations, but I don't know. Uh, I think people are still trickling in. And I just want to quickly say, please, everyone, keep your mics muted. Uh, and then uh, after, uh, uh, Laila Chako will introduce everybody, and then Amrita will host the conversation with our esteemed guests. And then uh, we will uh, take questions in the chat. And in the chat, which I will moderate, I will ask you if you want to be spotlighted on screen and to ask the question, or if you would like Amrita to ask the question for you. So just uh, respond to me in the chat uh, when the time comes, okay? So I'm going to leave now. I'll be in the chat. Please, uh, everyone else, please mute. And I'm handing everything over to Laila Chako, the director of the India Center at University of Central Florida. Thank you, Bhakti. The India Center at UCF works to broaden the understanding and uh, awareness of contemporary India and also promotes the study of India in the world today. We work to build relationships between the United States and India through partnerships, scholarship, education, research, and outreach. And we are so happy to join with the UCF English Department and the Radical Books Collective for today's discussion. Gitanjali Shri is the winner of the International Booker Prize for 2022 for the in English translation of her novel, Red Samadhi, titled Tomb of Sand. She's the author of five novels, as well as short collections, short story collections, and her work has been translated into English, French, German, Serbian, and Korean. She was born in Manpuri, India in 1957. Tomb of Sand is the first of her books to be published in the UK. <laughs> and she has received and been shortlisted for a number of awards and fellowships and currently lives in New Delhi. Daisy Rockwell is an artist and translator living in Vermont. She has translated numerous books from Hindi and Urdu into English. Her translation of Krishna Sobti's A Gujarat Here, A Gujarat There was awarded the MLA's Jean and Aldo Scaglione Prize for translation. And she is the winner with, with author Gitanjali Shri of the 2022 International Booker Prize for her translation of Tomb of Sand. Amrita Ghosh is an assistant professor of South Asian literatures at the University of Central Florida. She writes and publishes in the area of post-colonial and decolonial studies, South Asian conflict zones and partition studies. Her monograph on Kashmir's new literatures is coming out soon. And now I'll hand it over to Amrita. Thank you everybody for being here today on a Saturday morning. I'm, I'm absolutely honored and delighted that uh, I get this chance to speak with Gitanjali Shri and um, Daisy Rockwell, who have both been traveling and uh, Gitanjali, I know you're still traveling. So absolutely delighted. A quick word of thanks. Um, this event would not have been possible without India Center at UCF. My department, the English department with the support of chair, Dr. James Campbell. And last but not the least, Radical Books Collective, Professor Bhakti Shringarpare, who came up with the idea. So thank you to everybody. I am going to begin the conversation with a question to Gitanjali. Um, the Tomb of Sand is such a rich novel and it brings in so many different genres and literary traditions. There is some realism, of course, fable, magic realism is there too. Is there a reason why a partition story narrated in our present time needed to stay away from gritty social realism that we have that we are used to in the great oeuvre of partition literature? Why did you feel the need to render the story by giving this uh, fable-like quality? Um, thank you, Amrita. It's it's great to be here, and I'm a bit. Um, um, I, I, I'm just. Uh, I've just stepped out of various events, so please forgive me. I'm going to really flounder and um, speak um, in a confused, rigmaroleish way, but hopefully it'll make some sense. Um, 
I lost some of your words, but I think I know uh, what you're saying. Um, first of all, you know, uh, um, this book has been put in the category of partition literature. I'm not sure I entirely uh, agree that it's re really in that uh, genre. I mean, there, um, all of you have read the book and you know that partition only figures. I mean, it becomes a very important backdrop, but it's really in a very small part of the book that it uh, you know, comes to the fore in a big way. But sure, I mean, and um, many other partitions are talked about in the book, not just the partition uh, with capital P, which is the India-Pakistan story. So, so one, I don't think any tradition of the partition novels really. Uh, neither am I trying to break from the way that story has been told, nor am I trying in any way to continue that story. So I think I was on some other journey in which partition also came in. That's, for me, I think it's uh, important to um, clarify that. Um, I would say, um, you know, I think, Authors are always looking for different strategies to talk about the reality. And strategies often evolve in the course of telling the story. So it's not that I set out to tell it in a different way. Um, you said fable-like quality. And I think that um, I actually I come from a tradition where fables are very much part of our um, you know, literary law. So I've grown up on fables. I've grown up on um, that form of telling stories that various others too I've been exposed to. So I think all these have come together, influenced me without you know, thinking about it consciously. And uh, the, the way this uh, novel has um, decided in the course of being written it, it has decided to uh, adopt a lot of these strategies to tell the tale. So there's the fable and there are those philosophical interludes and there are various other things which I'm sure all of you will be able to define much better than me. So I think it's a lot of it is intuitive and uh, you know just imbibing um, from my own culture and from things I have um, grown up on and read and been exposed to and all of it coming together and giving me lots of ways of expressing myself. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to stay with the partition um, a little more because mm -hmm. I was absolutely fascinated with the brilliant third section, part three of the novel. And it is a tribute to partition literary greats yeah. Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi, canonical texts from the subcontinent appear in the novel. And there are not just partition writers, but there are iconic characters from partition literature that come to life. What motivated you to conceive of such a homage? How did you carve out this incredible section, which literary, uh, literally reminded me um, of this kind of reenactment of Manto's Tobatik Singh? as the partition writers in your novel are defiant against the status borders around them? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, not just partition writers, I think writers and a lot of us are against this uh, partition and against the making of borders. The fact of the matter is that the partition you are referring to in India is something we, which is very live for us. You know, it's not over. And it's certainly not complete, you know, the, uh, the partition has been made, but uh, people on both sides are um, very together, very much one family, also enemy nations. So it's a very strange relationship, love and hate that India and Pakistan have. And 
all of us, I mean, my generation and of course the generation before me, and perhaps even the next generation is not free of the trauma of partition and the stories of partition, whether, especially in North India, I couldn't speak uh, too much about um, uh, what's called South India, but the entire North India, partition is a reality which continues to be in our midst even today. And, uh, you know, partition and its uh, fallout, uh, its very sinister and ugly fallout is um, poisoning the atmosphere even today. So it is something very real that all of us are dealing with. So um, I think I feel very much at one with these writers. I've certainly read them and loved them. And it was perfectly natural for them to wander into the tale, whatever, I mean, whatever you'd like to call it, the tale in this novel. But about uh, Vaga specifically, I just remember a little, uh, uh, you know, something which happened, uh, a little autobiography. I just remember going to Vaga and seeing that, I don't know if any of you know, that strange ceremony that they have when they um, lower the flags and open the gates and the, uh, you know, guard, guards from both sides come and do, you know, me, um, face each other and do a very surreal martial dance, you know, and look at each other with um, mock anger and threatening uh, looks and try to show that they are mightier than the other. So it's all very comic at one level, but the people who are watching on both sides are all filled with such vulgar, nationalistic fervor at that point, that it's quite frightening. And I remember when I was uh, watching that, I actually began to feel very disturbed. And I could not uh, look at it all the time. And I just kept lowering my head in shame and pain. And I think when I was doing that, all these writers just crowded around me. And I could just see those Ooh. writers everywhere feeling absolutely uh, flabbergasted and uh, pained at what was going on and not knowing which side they belonged to because you know it made no sense that border made no sense to them and i think that may have been in the genesis which uh, happened later in the course of writing the book Thank you, Gitanjali. That almost gave me goosebumps while you were talking about the writers in this kind of unknowability about the space, the no man's land. Um, yeah. I'm going to turn to Daisy. This question is for you. Um, and you may have encountered this many times before, but in a text like this, which is such a weave of wordplay and humor that is embedded in the Hindi language, and I'm remembering um, just one moment, which is the character Bare, and then there's a wordplay with Behi Bare, which is fantastic, I thought, <laughs> as an instance. How hard was the process of translation when it was uh, supposedly said this was an untranslatable work? And um, of course, some of our, or all our viewers know that this uh, novel has also been translated in French. Specifically, could you tell us about your choices you made to create the dhwani, the, the sounds in the Hindi language that you talk about in the translator's note? Um, how did you recreate that in the English language? Um, yeah, it was extremely difficult. Um, and I think what I, I would say the first, before I agree to translate a book, I have, to, I sort of think about the thing that's most key to being able to make to to making the um the translation successful and um with this book i realized after just a few pages there's a pun that she makes between um nahi and nai right and uh meaning no and new um and this is this the sort of around the, the um the focus of, of Ma, the protagonist, 
um, being in a state of no ness because she's lying. Sorry, my cat is invading the space here. Um, the, the character is lying in bed and she's saying she doesn't want to get up and she's saying no, no, no. So nahi, nahi, nahi. And then this transforms into nai, which means new. Um, can you hear these binging on my screen or no? My screen, I just, my computer started to bing, so I'm hoping you're not hearing the sound. Anyway, so it transforms from the he to nai. And I thought if I can't do that, I can't do this book because I felt like that was actually the core of what the book was about, that pun. And um, I just like as a sideline, I want to say that that punning is in, um, in, in the English language world is considered just for humor, right? Like, so puns are funny, but this isn't necessarily a funny pun. And there's a huge tradition in South Asia of like, especially in Sanskrit um, of shlesha, which is these puns that are not meant for humor. For example, an entire a text could be both the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, depending on where you divide up the words. Um, so I took I took this in that tradition. I think he's Pantley's writing in that tradition that puns can aren't necessarily funny, um, that they are just a, a, even a very serious part of writing, a very serious part of where we say word play and we make it sound all fun, but it's also can be a very serious way of thinking about language. So I so I went into that little transformation, Nahi to Nai, and I said, how can I go from no to new and uh, luckily I, they had to, I had the same the n sounds for both English and Hindi so that made it easier but I I had to twist it and pull it in different ways to make it happen whether successfully or not I don't know my daughter was looking over my shoulder and laughing at me at the time she was about eight and when I first started to work on that um, but I managed to do it. I managed to get there. So then I, that was what made me agree to do the book. And then from then on, you know, it's all over the place, like the Dahi, Dahi Bade and Bade. That was actually the, that joke I couldn't translate because <laughs> um, it was kind of like, yeah, it was a pun that I, that I would have destroyed it if I had recreated it in English. So I also made the choice sometimes to just keep the Hindi because I know from past experiences from other books I've translated that many of my readers know Hindi and Urdu and don't don't read in the are not likely to read the book in Hindi or Urdu either because they can't they're not literate or they're semi-literate or they've gotten out of the habit or something so I know I have a lot of readers that know these languages so um, sometimes something was too good to give up and I just either left it in or gave it a gloss or whatever. So, um, but Gitanjali did encourage me to, to play with the language the way that she had. So for example, she'll have a word that she that suddenly kind of strikes her and she'll start to free associate and have words that are similar that may not, that it's uh, in, in terms of sound and may not have um, necessarily that much importance to the actual meaning of the word. So I would do the same thing in English, think of associations and try to find words that reminded me of the way Hindi sounds. Like, so the kind of the soundscape of Hindi, the way that Hindi loves rhyming pairs of words, for example, I would try to um, find words like that, that um, would reduplicate what she had been doing. So it's Again, as you said, Adwani, which is the word she uses for translation or in a, in a section on translation, she uses that term and it's like an, an echo or a vibration. Um, so I tried to create vibrations with what she had been doing. Thank you. Um, my next question stems from what you have been talking about and it really um, raises the question of authenticity to the original um, Hindi Red Samadhi. And um, I would, this question is for you, Daisy, but I would love to hear from both of you about this issue about um, of authenticity and translation. And um, I was reading an interview by Daisy, and you say, and I'm quoting you here, 
a translation is an interpretation, a refraction, a reworking, and as such, it contains something old, but also contains something new. Mm -hmm. and, and I noticed in the English version, there were a lot more pauses. There are many more blank pages that are left uh, before one begins the next chapter. And this also makes the English version much longer. Um, we know that there's always this debate about authenticity and the original. And yet this is a newer version of the Hindi novel. Mm -hmm. How did you both negotiate in constructing and reworking of the original Hindi writing? It was a very lengthy process because um, there's a lot about uh, the writing in this book that is um, really specific to Gitanjali. And um, so even if you're reading it in Hindi, you, you might feel like you knew what it meant. But if you actually were asked to pin it down, you would have a very hard time, you know, no matter how good your Hindi is. And so there were a lot of things where I really had to, dis it's, it's very almost unfair to ask an author to say, why did you do this? Or what do you really mean here? Like, I don't really think that that's something authors should be asked, but I had to ask her, I had to understand. So even if something was purposefully vague or ambiguous, I still have to know as best as I can what is actually going on to make it, to bring that ambiguity properly into another language. So we had to go back and forth and I, I have said, and I think this is true that I asked her at least 10 questions per page of the original Hindi and some passages was back and forth over and over and over and over again. It was really exhaustive and exhausting. Um, but I think we did a great job in communicating with each other and preserving what we both felt was important to preserve and hash out things that we didn't agree on or we didn't initially understand each other regarding. Thank you. I don't know if Gitanjali wants to add to that. <laughs> oh, I think what Daisy said is absolutely spot on. But, but I, I, I don't know if I want to add anything there, but you know, this whole thing of um, the authentic, I find a slightly, um, I think, disturbing word, you know, what is authentic? <laughs> because it's a uh, text is so fluid, actually. So I think you are. Um, you are playing with fluidity. Mm -hmm. Of course, it has to be within some uh, uh, I don't know, ethical parameters, you know. But if to be translation, it has to be within those parameters that you play. But in replaying that, uh, you, you actually give a new breath and a, a new personality almost. So it is the same book, but it also is in that sense, a different book, you know, as, as long as we realize this is not to be taken literally, you know, mm -hmm. so, so I think um, uh, that that is absolutely a wonderful thing that happens in translation. But the other thing which I felt with Daisy, um, very quickly, I think I realized that was that Daisy was loving very much, I mean, she was doing it with such a lot of love, the things that I had done in uh, my Hindi and in my uh, novel, Red Samadhi. So there she was, you know, uh, playing it with, in her language and in her culture with the same kind of love and involvement and uh, uh, inventiveness. So in a way, it made for so much trust and rapport between us. Yeah, that the disagreements ever, but we never felt that these are going to come in the way, and we have to, in any nasty way, kind of shut up and just accept it or shut the other person up. I think we we could go along very happily because we were both doing our work very happily with lots of love, right? <laughs> same sorts of things. <laughs> like I said, I mean, like I said recently, we were together in Penang and we were talking about this, and I said, just suppose I'd got a very good. Um, um, translator who was very good with language and had done wonderful things with um, books and didn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> and that person completely ruined this book. So really it was fortuitous that it was Daisy and everything 
fell into place very nicely. <laughs> Can I add something? I think um, that's something I haven't brought up before, but I've been thinking about it lately. Um, a kind of an example of how the, um, the love and the humor aspect of it is there's a passage that people haven't talked about that much where um, it's about the bells and whistles in women's writing, you know, so the way that, um, and the, a lot of this is implicit, but she, basically the passage discusses how women, you know, it's sort of the Jane Austen model, you know, how people say that Jane Austen would be sitting in her drawing room and write a little bit and then stick it under the blotting paper because someone would come in. So women are interrupted all the time while they're writing, they're running a household and parenting and doing all these things. Um, and so the bells and whistles are like the, the, the sounds of like the, um, the doorbell and the phone and the cooker and, you know, everything going off. So I was translating that passage in a high or a college gymnasium while my daughter was practicing for a tap dance routine. There was a rehearsal. So there were these little girls tap dancing in the same room as where I was actually translating a first draft. And there was also some athletic thing happening on the side. And there were all different sounds going on at once. I wrote that in the margins that this had was happening to me while I was doing this. And I did this tweak to the translation because in the Hindi it was, she actually calls it whistle bell writing. Like that's like, like a CT, I don't even remember what's the other word, CT something. Kunti. Yeah, CT Kunti. So I changed it to bells and whistles because that actually means something else and additional in English bells and whistles like say oh I'm gonna I bought my new car and it's got all the bells and whistles you know so it's it's a, a positive connotation so I turned it into something slightly different I added something to it to make it um to show kind of my embrace of the concept it's like our writing is interrupted all the time but that makes it extra special it has all the bells and whistles so that's an example of how Sort of that love and intuition and um, interplay between us occurred. Uh, um, I'm absolutely fascinated because uh, Bhakti is also mentioning in the chat here, I, I guess authenticity perhaps is not the right word, but also fidelity. And there was this crossing of boundaries between the writer and the translator right there in how you're talking about this process. Um, my next question is also to both of you. And um, I mean, Tumba of San Samadhi is the talk of towns. It has crossed literal borders in ways that, you know, yesterday I saw New Yorker crossword had the Tumba of San in it, uh, which is fascinating. And oh, did you know that, Gitanjali? It's no, the middle, you know, in a crossword puzzle, the, there's sometimes the middle answer <laughs> is really long. It spans the whole grid. And it Wonderful. was, who is the author of the 2022 Booker award-winning novel, Tomb of Sin? So it's your name. Here's the middle. It's like what came on that Amitabh Bachchan show. Yes, yes. Yeah, we came, we were on there too. Yes. <laughs> so I'm fascinated. This is That's our bells and whistles, huh? Yes, we've got all the bells and whistles. <laughs> yeah. So it is the first honor for a Hindi language novel as the International Booker Prize. Um, and it is tremendous news for South Asian languages and literatures overall. And it also highlights the incredible realm of South Asian vernacular literature and the role that translation plays when the field is literally dominated by Anglophone works. From both your perspective, will this change writing, translation, publishing, and even reading um, regional literatures in a more mainstream way. And by mainstream, I mean in India and global mainstream, what is considered um, literature, South Asian, global South literatures. You want me to answer? That's it. I think, I mean, we hope it will change, but we don't, you know, we can't predict. But I think both of us are very hopeful, you know, like, I've heard a lot of people have said to me since we won, well, you know, other South Asians have won the Booker and they go that lets them in the door, you know, into the big, big leagues, but they let the door slam behind them. And so I keep saying, we don't want the door to slam behind us. We're, we're going to do our yeah. best to hold it open and bring 
through as many people as possible. So we want, like, we want to support the, the um, this ecosystem of South Asian translation exists within South Asia, and it has very little of it has ever gotten out. So there's all this English yeah. language translation, but it's hardly ever come out. So we want to help it get out. We want others to follow us, and we know that we're just that the two of us represent just a part of this enormous ecosystem, and we 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 want the rest of those voices to emerge as well. Yeah, well, I, I just say, if, I mean, I just add to that. I entirely agree with what Daisy is saying. Uh, um, I would just say, look, no, I mean, something becomes um, an excuse to suddenly um, bring into the visible zone a reality which has been escaping people, you know, hitherto. So that's what's happened with um, this book in translation, getting the booker, that suddenly people are thinking about uh, um, literature. Certainly, um, what's uh, quite um, wonderful, but um, also, I mean, it's distressing that even in my country, even in the Hindi speaking belt, uh, the uh, people are reading mostly English. And it's so this book has suddenly, I mean, this booker has suddenly made them sit up. And a lot of them, are, you know, they come to me and they say, after 30 years, we read our first Hindi book. So that's happening. And they want to read Hindi. Mm -hmm. Now, I hope, as Daisy says, that this doesn't become just one, you know, uh, moment of thrill. And then they, you said, slow behind us. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope it really opens up a new awareness and curiosity. And somebody was recently telling me that the Frankfurt Book Fair, the publishers were all very interested in, more interested in what was happening in the other languages in uh, South Asia rather than in English. They, and they wanted very much to tap that literature. Now, if this thing becomes a sustained trend, then surely something wonderful has happened in which we've been the incidental mediums. Yeah. And I must add that um, when my parents came to know that I was doing this event with you both, my father made sure that I read the Hindi also with the English. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <Wow. laughs> and you know, that's become really popular. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's become popular to read them side by side. And I've, I, I've also about yes, yes. Yes. Lots of people are doing it whether they feel weak in one language or the other. Um, mm. And that makes me so happy because I love the idea of translation being a pathway back to the original yeah. language. And that kind of uh, disturbs the hegemony of English in a way that, that, uh, that we can use mm. English to, to go to the mm. other languages and not just have it like sit on the other languages and crush them all. I have one last question before I open it up for, for all our uh, participants today. And my question is to both of you again. And um, I wanna bring it back to the novel and the narrative. And one of the things that really excited me about the novel was the polyphony of voices. And this very self-reflexive narrator telling us the readers what to listen to, when there are digressions, even to stop at some point if we have no interest in a certain path of a story. So this is a text that is very aware of itself and it perhaps can pose a problem from the reader's point of view in both the Hindi and the English versions. How did you both manage this self-reflexivity that never really takes over, but is slipped into the background, laughing at politics, leaders, always very astutely critical of the historical events. Hmm. <laughs> well, I, 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 mean, I never thought of um, my text as being uh, self-reflexive in that sort of way. So I'm a little surprised that you call it that. One, it has many narrators, right? And quite mad narrators. So. <laughs> the crows and the door and all, you know, I mean, uh, um, you know, they just, they bring in a certain kind of, um, I, I wouldn't say 
um, very logical, self-reflexive uh, narration there. But uh, unless you're talking of the, so those uh, discursive philosophical bits that keep um, creeping in, even those I think are of many different kinds. I mean, there are those which talk about you know the creative uh, process to talk about what a story is and how it how it is wavered and goes in different directions but even those also go on their mad flights quite often which are um extra so i so i don't i'm uh, unfortunately i'm not very sure what you mean when you say self reflexive my whole approach i think to my writing is intuitive and not intuitive in the sense of it being something you know completely mysterious and coming out of a vacuum. It's very formed intuitive, but it's not about it's not about just uh, putting down on paper things that I'm completely conscious of. You know, it's about pulling out things that have gone into um, you know behind that consciousness and in the hidden reaches of my. Uh, you know, being who, uh, from whatever various sources and it's gone into my intuition and, you know, pulling it out from there. And, and that's a discovery for me also, you know, because I don't always know what all is, um, has um, formed that intuition of mine. So for me, my approach is not um, self-reflexive in the way perhaps that you are saying it but i'm not sure maybe we are talking slightly tangentially i'm not sure but daisy maybe well you and i i would just add that i too am intuitive so mm -hmm. that uh, people i say well how did you handle all those voices and i don't really have an answer because i just listened to them and um i talk about it sometimes as like a channeling process like that i'm sort of just trying to channel what Gitanjali was thinking and channel these voices and find them. And there's a way in which I think we um, both are so intuitive that, um, that even Gitanjali speaks of her own writing process as something of a channeling effect that the story presented itself to her and it, and it led her along. And it was the same for me as a translator that, that I um, just followed it along and I listened to it and I listened to her voices and I don't, I don't have a logical reason why I made a lot of choices because I just knew that this was how it should be. I actually love the fact that you both made me reconfigure or reimagine reflexivity with intuitiveness. And I mm -hmm. think that's a really nice way of putting it. Here. I think that's a good point. I mean, at some level, I mean, one has to perhaps uh, wonder how self-reflexive intuition might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I now will open up the forum for our participants to ask questions. And we're starting with Kevin Nian, um, who will ask the first question. So Bhakti, if you could please spotlight Kevin Nian. Everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, I want to say I'm very grateful for this event and everybody and every institution that helped to make it happen. I love many things about this novel, uh, and I had many questions, but I'll, I'll just offer one question for the Q&A. And uh, this is for the author. I very much enjoyed the depiction of crows throughout <laughs> the book, especially the character of Jack and Napes, <laughs> who was at first is a young firebrand who wants to drop rocks on body's head, <laughs> but then receives the Croes's message of Croish sympathy and he becomes a friend to Bade. And later a willing, but perhaps uncomprehended messenger who flies across the borders to gather and bring back intel about Ma's fate when she goes missing across the border. Apart from how the crows carry a message about uh, the unnatural reality of tribalisms and partition, and maybe how they contribute to an eco-critical horizon in the novel, I feel that they also help to build a minor but very important thread on youth and education. And that's really what I wanted to ask about. I wanted to see 
what the author's thoughts and feelings might be about how educational institutions, both formal and informal, are situated to deal with future prospects of, uh, of greed and imperialism and borders and visas and partition and religious hatred and so mm -hmm. on. <laughs> and is the book hopeful about young people and about the future? Thank you. Well, I I don't know. I really I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to answer that very well. Is the book hopeful? I'm sure the book is, you know, book is hopeful in the middle of despair. You know, the, the book is despairing about what's. Uh, happening in the world. Uh, the book is despairing about disunities and divisions, but the very fact that uh, the author is impelled to write about this and uh, uh, talk about this um, alternative world that there was and still is, where things are united, where there is love and humanity, I think that is uh, makes the book you know, a book of hope, even if it's in the middle of despair. About um, the author's, uh, you know, sense of uh, hope in the youth of today, I think, I think I do have a lot of hope from the youth. I mean, I think there are terrible things happening all around, and I think we are all feeling very, um, um, what's the word, you know, sort of, the, the storm is, upon us and don't have control. But I've always felt um, very, very energized when I met um, young people. You know, they haven't given up. The future belongs to them and the world actually belongs to them. And so many of them, I mean, when, you, when you're talking of large trends, then what you see is despairing. But when you start going to the details, going to specific places, going to like, the people in the, these institutions, the ones who are um, talking to us today, I mean, these are all trying to talk about the importance of um, free thought, thinking through things, seeing what we are doing to the environment. And these are, I think, sources of hope and places which, from where people will come out and possibly do their bit to save the world. So I, this author would really like to believe that things are possible still. Yeah. Thank you. I would invite all our audience and participants to have a question, please, as we move along with the Q&A. I now have another question from SM, and I'm going to read that out for you all. And this question is for Daisy Rockwell. Uh, Daisy, you have touched upon some of the things that um, the, the question already is asking, but perhaps you could touch upon some more towards the end of the question um, that are there. So the question is, it would be great to hear whether and how you collaborated with Gitanjali in the translation process and how you decided to use the various forms, registers of English in the translation, which you kind of covered. Mm -hmm. But this one is interesting. How far did the readership or readerships of the translation influence your translation strategies? Thank you. Oh, yeah, so audience is everything for any kind of writing, right? Um, so I think a lot about audience when I'm translating and I, my journey as a translator has made me change my point of view about who my audience is. Because when I first started out, I assumed that the people who could read the original would read it. And um, that my audience would be people who had no knowledge or did not know the language and knew nothing about the culture. So I assumed this very unknowledgeable audience. And I quickly learned that I was wrong and that the vast majority of my audience was, um, you know, either Indians or Pakistanis or South Asians in South Asia and or also diaspora um, South Asians, including those who recently emigrated and those that are multi-generations from immigration. So 
Um, so I started to realize that I um, that I had a very highly knowledgeable audience that either chose not to or could not read the original. And so I think of it like a tent, like this big tent. And so on the very one very far extreme, let's say over here, is, are the people that are completely fluent in the original language and literate. And for some reason, are not reading it in that language. And then on the other side of the tent on this hand is um, my mother-in-law who is not Indian and lives in New Jersey and doesn't know anything about South Asia except for what I would tell her. And so um, I think, how can I get all these people into the tent? And it's not an easy trick, you know, because these people will be unhappy if it's not translated enough. And these ones are unhappy if they think it's over translated. And so I use a lot of tricks to keep everyone in the tent. And one of them, for example, is that I've noticed that South Asian readers, if, if there's like say a, um, a poem or a song, like say a Bollywood song, if I just put an English translation of the lyrics, they will be really annoyed because they want to know what song it was. Um, so I always put the original and the translation, or if it's a couplet of by Golub or something like that, a famous poet, I'll put the original transliterated and um, the translation. And that way they can actually hear these words that they may actually know, right? That's part of what makes the English longer <laughs> is that I'm having these double um, quotations going throughout it. And then for on the other side of things, um, you know, there are certain words that are very common in Indian English that are not known at all to people outside. Um, and so I try Excuse to, me? to double, Sorry. what's that? Okay, so I try to double clock. Sorry. <laughs> Where's that sound coming from? If you can please mute yourself um, from the participants side. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, so I try to um, to gloss within the text. So sometimes it's just like on a side, I'll, I'll put the Hindi word that everyone is used to using in Indian English, and then I'll put the English meaning just kind of with commas, you know, as an appositional phrase. So there are a lot of ways that I try to bring everybody in together so that everyone can enjoy the book. And I think part of the success of Tuma Sand, that translation is that I've been doing this for a long time and developing these techniques. And this is my first book, as well as Gitanjali's first book to be published in the UK. And so the success I think is because I, was, I have worked on this so long that I think I, I have been able to embrace a, a fairly large audience. Thank you. Um, the next question is special. Um, it is from Mitali Kodiar, and it is special because um, there is this transcending of certain linguistic borders going to happen here. She will okay. be asking the question in Hindi for Great. us. Great. Namaskar, Gitanjali ji. Namaskar. Uh, madam, my question is that I am a Hindi teacher, and now the time is that. हिंदी माध्यम स्कूल जो बंद होते जा रहे हैं सभी अंग्रेजी की तरफ जा रहे हैं और कई बार जब मैं हिंदी पढ़ाती भी हूं तब बहुत दूसरे विषय के लोग बहुत ज्यादा मजाक भी उड़ाते हैं कि अब हिंदी कौन पढ़ना चाहता है तो आपका जो पुरस्कार है वो बहुत अच्छा जवाब है और मुझे बहुत गर्व महसूस हुआ जब आप पुरस्कार जीती और मैं स्कूल में गई तो मैंने कहा कि ये देखिए हिंदी के साहित्यकार बुकर पुरस्कार जीतते हैं तो मैं जाना चाहती हूं कि हिंदी को वैश्विक स्तर पर एक अच्छी पहचान तो मिली ही है और क्या आपका जो बुकर पुरस्कार है इसे हम हिंदी भाषा के लिए क्या एक आशा की किरण के रूप में देख सकते हैं इस पे आपके विचार जानना चाहूंगी Fortunately we have a lot of translations amongst us they see would you like to translate the question and then Gitanjali you can respond Okay I'm not a simultaneous translator but um, basically, she's talking, she's a Hindi teacher, and she's talking about how everybody's turning away from Hindi these days. And um, 
uh, valuing English over Hindi and it's kind of a moment of despair for somebody who's a Hindi teacher and she's hoping that this prize will change things and she wants Gitanjali to uh, comment on that. देखिए आप जो बात कह रही हैं बिल्कुल सही है ये बहुत अफसोस की बात है कि हम लोग ने हिंदी को एक नीचा दर्जा दे दिया है काफी हद तक और आप आप जब ये बता रहे आप अपने अपना तजुर्बा बता रही थी तो उस समय मैं सोच रही थी कि देखिए मैं भी मुझसे भी ये सवाल बहुत बार इस तरह से पूछा गया है कि आप हिंदी में क्यों लिखती हैं जब आप अंग्रेजी में लिख सकती हैं मतलब हिंदी में क्या रखा है तो ये सवाल मुझसे मेरे देशवासी पूछते हैं और ये इसीलिए है कि हमने हिंदी को दोयम दर्जे का बना दिया है तो ये बहुत अफसोस की बात है इस पुरस्कार से जरूर लोगों में एक ऐसी चेतना आई है कि नई भाषा को कम तर नहीं समझना है लेकिन सिर्फ एक पल की खुशी इसको लेकर होगी जीत की तो उससे कुछ नहीं होने वाला है जब तक कि हम हिंदी को एक सकारात्मक ढंग से अपने जीवन का हिस्सा नहीं बनाएंगे अपनी शिक्षा का हिस्सा नहीं बनाएंगे छात्रों में इस बात का एहसास नहीं डाल पाएंगे कि देखो दूसरी भाषाएं सीखने में कोई परेशानी नहीं है और अंग्रेजी तो इस समय की बहुत जरूरी महत्वपूर्ण भाषा है लेकिन इसके लिए ये क्यों आवश्यक है कि अपनी भाषा को दरकिनार कर दो या भूल ही जाओ सब हम एक से ज्यादा भाषा आराम से सीख सकते हैं अपनी भाषा को भी महत्व दो तो ये चीजें सिर्फ एक पुरस्कार से नहीं होगा जब तक कि हमारे मानस में हमारी चेतना में ये बात ना आ जाए और आप शिक्षिका हैं तो जब तक कि बच्चों को ये बात ना समझ में आए तब तक वो बात कहीं जाएगी नहीं हमको ये करना पड़ेगा जी जी मैडम आप आपने मतलब हमको हमारा सर ऊंचा कर दिया हम हिंदी भाषियों का सच में धन्यवाद आपका <laughs> I'm going to try um uh, really broadly translate that and please uh Daisy fill in if or anybody mm-hmm. else um Gitanjali too and um what Gitanjali has just said is that she has been um given the same kind of reactions many a times that what why are you writing in Hindi when you could write in English uh from people in India and so one of the things that she's saying is that one award or this kind of limelight will not completely solve the problem and uh, until and unless people with an education with an everyday lives have a use of hindi in a larger substantial way um and to break that hegemony of language not that english is important it is extremely important but to understand the value of vernacular language like hindi for us in our in the nation of india um then there would be certain changes that are possible and i'm really butchering up the translation there was a lot more that was important so pardon me but if um, not, just, not just hindi no, 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 no. i think you've got the general you are, you are saying mm-hmm. generally what you say but it's also not just about hindi it's about one i mean what is the problem in knowing more than one language Mm-hmm. which we are living in so many nations in the world that you know so easily know more than one language what is the problem and why should you have to um, you know dismiss your own language or put it in a lower position and give another language i won't say for because i think i no longer a particularly foreign language it's very much a part of our uh, one of the languages in india now so but but there is no need to uh hierarchy you know to um, to make a hierarchy of languages where you put your own mother tongue somewhere you know further down why mm-hmm. there's absolutely no need to do that i mean learn both languages mm-hmm. yeah and something that um uh, people keep asking gitanjali the question why doesn't she write in english and she always says uh hindi is my mother tongue why shouldn't i be writing in it and i think that even though that's a very obvious answer for some reason it doesn't occur to a lot of people because of this issue of prioritizing english over other right. yeah. yeah 
Thank you. Um, our next question is from the founder of Radical Books Collective, Bhakti. Uh, please ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, this has been going wonderfully. So many great topics covered. Uh, I just wanted to get back to the, you know, reason Amrita and I felt very compelled to organize this event. And that happened when there was a sort of controversy uh, in India, uh, where I think you were prohibited, Gitanjali, from doing an event. And I just wanted to ask generally, how do you think the reception of the novel and then the, the novel first, and then later on the translation and the honors uh, that came out of the booker. How has the reception been uh, in India? I know when uh, when uh, the booker was uh, was given, there was like an Amul butter, uh, you know, like post, like what is it, a billboard or something like that. So I know that they, there was these kind of unofficial things, but I also know that there perhaps wasn't an official appreciation. Uh, from uh, from the Indians. Just very quickly about reception in India. And then Kevin was asking something similar uh, about if you know anything about the reception in, um, he's saying Pakistan and in Kashmir specifically. Well, uh, you know, this is um, again, a very large question. The Booker is actually still, I mean, it's just a few months old. So these things, I mean, it, it's traveling slowly to Pakistan. So we'll know the response bit by bit. And it's a mixed response. I mean, as anything would have, you know, I mean, there would be those who, who are absolutely delighted. And um, it's not kind of star adulation. I think there are uh, people, uh, uh, there's a sort of extended community around me, which feels that something really wonderful has happened. And, uh, you know, uh, they feel proud that uh, South Asian language has got uh, this kind of recognition. And, and that is very genuine. There are people who don't uh, feel that, feel, you know, there's, why do we need uh, um, any kind of recognition from the West? Um, it's important, you know, why are we giving so much importance to something from the West? And there are people, I mean, there may be different reasons why people choose to be silent or angry about it or dismissive about it. And that is all that's bound to happen. And actually, I uh, I mean, I, I can't, I just sometimes think, why should I waste my time thinking, of, especially for, you know, extra literary uh, considerations. I mean, ultimately, what we have been involved in is literature. So I'm not really that interested in extraordinary reasons coming in to dismiss the work. I, I really don't want to waste my time on that. So of course I want to be safe. And of course, when necessary, I would uh, want to speak up and uh, say whatever has to be said. But uh, otherwise I, I don't want to engage um, in a conversation with someone who has extra literary reasons to for debunking me or making things difficult so that's the main thing because you know you, you get that fame and, uh, invariably there's going to be criticism and if they decide if anybody decides that they want to find objectionable things in a work then you pick up any book and you're going to find it because you know you, you there's no Oh, um, you're not trying to be sensible. It's all being done in a completely arbitrary and um, even stupid, I may say, manner. So, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, I'm, uh, I won't name the country just now, but I, I was just recently in a country where old man, and it's a non-vegetarian country, solidly non-vegetarian country. Old man and the sea is banned in that country. Why? There's violence in that. I mean, what do you say? You can't, you can't, there's, there's no room, there's no possibility of a dialogue, you know, when things of that sort happen. So you really, you have to, as possible, steer clear of these completely, you know, useless um, um, debate discussions, I feel. Gitanjali, now we are just stuck thinking, which country is this? Sounds no, like yeah. the United States. <laughs> <laughs> you have to <laughs> I lost your voice there. 
-hmm. I said, we are now all stuck thinking which country you're referring to this. Oh, mystery. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, I, I just thought I'll be kind and not name the country. <laughs> Curious. Yeah, you know, thank you so much. Of course, asking you this question brings us to this idea of like how you can protect yourself and keep doing the work you do without being uh you know harassed by these uh these kinds of uh, these kinds of things um yeah but it's just it's tough because everything becomes so political and the atmosphere currently is so uh harsh for uh you know literature and culture um mainly i don't know daisy if you wanted to add something you know i i my i work uh within african literature and i know that just the when gugiwa thiongo um, was exiled and imprisoned and so on and so forth. His writer, his translator also uh, suffered in proxy and so on. So, you know, I know that one takes on these um, these problems, even if they are not physically maybe impacting you or mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, there was a humorous side of that, of that incident that you talked about, which is that they, uh, the police, said they would take it under consideration and read the book and decide if it was offensive. Mm -hmm. And so that to me was just the most hilarious to imagine all these, you know, officers in the Agra, Agra police station trying to make sense of either version of the, the book. And um, that's, I mean, I think what I love about the book, it's extremely subversive politically but on the other hand it's not easy to find that message like you have to be reading really seriously to get it you can't just take, pull a sound bite out of this book to understand what makes it subversive and the and the what they did pull out of it was um which is a really silly example like and i think that's why it didn't go anywhere um but yes we're in the same boat writer and translator and the, i'm translating an earlier book of Gitanjali's that's much more openly political and um, you know we've talked about what the consequences could be of that and we're mm -hmm. on board for it yeah yeah you know. thank you that's funny it's, uh, it's, it's, linked, it's linked entirely to freedom of expression you know which yeah. is which is not a um, it's not a luxury you know I mean I think it's absolutely essential for any society to have that mm -hmm. so but I think writers and artists, and I think um, all citizens who care for freedom of expression will keep looking for ways of continuing that. And they'll continue that in an atmosphere which is less risky or more risky, mm -hmm. but they'll, they'll just have to continue that. That's their way, that, that's their, um, that's just inbuilt in their, uh, uh, in whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Back to you, Amrita. Thank you. Um, this discussion also is so important to me because, you know, it really is also talking about the necessity of literature and art amidst us right now in these polemic uh, divisions that we reside in. And I wanted to ask one last question because I haven't gotten any from the audience yet. Um, and I wanted to return to Ma, who's this absolutely amazing character. Um, and she has this monologue on borders in the final section of the novel. And I kept thinking that border making is such a colonial project. And, you know, Gitanjali, you mentioned that it acutely, um, the trauma of partition acutely haunts us. It is not complete. Um, and the cleaving of India and Pakistan um, still haunts us constantly in South Asia. Um, definitely India, Pakistan, Bangladesh are party to that. Mm -hmm. and, my speech on borders goes something like this in the novel, I'm, and I'm quoting here. Um, it stops nothing. It is a bridge between two connected parts when two worlds meet, end quote. And this makes us rethink borders in a way that are not threatening and delimiting the nation state and its immediate other. However, as we were speaking about all these kinds of divisions and polemics out there, is it really viable and possible to reimagine the borders in our present time, borders that inflict so much hatred amongst us in being able to finally echo Ma's words in the novel, a border is love, she says. Um. 
Well, I'll give a very garbled response to that. Uh, first of all, why are you talking only of India-Pakistan-Bangladesh borders? The world is full of borders. And the world is, you know, some borders are actually, you know, why, why are borders being made in the first place? I mean, they are being made to demarcate two spaces, but um, for some kind of betterment of both. That is the ideal, you know, behind India. If you want to return to India, Pakistan, I mean, that is why they thought of this uh, two nation, uh, you know, uh, plan that thereafter the two nations will be adm administered better and they'll be independent and they will do what they please. They take these two nations to be ever in hostility with each other. So the intention of the border is to make things more efficient. What happens in practice after that is different with different borders. So, you know, it, it becomes a bloody and inhuman border quite often. But there are other borders. I mean, um, think of um, uh, the borders in uh, Europe. Think of France and Germany, which till recently were uh, fairly, you know, sort of uh, full of animosity for each other. And today they're not. And in fact, they, uh, Europe conceived um, of the idea of making a union. It may not have worked for whatever uh, reasons, but they did think of the European Union. They did think of, you know, uh, um, having borders and being friendly, you know, in a larger union. So I, I don't, I don't think there is a, you know, it's a hard and fast rule that the border has to be something which is hostile and ugly. Even in the U.S., I mean, you have two borders. I think the south, uh, the, the border in the south is the difficult one, and the one in the north is absolutely friendly. So I would say that. Uh, the intention of the border is not to make it a mess, you know, on both sides. The, at least the avowed intention when they say we need to break up. So, but of course, in practice, other things happen. About is it viable? Can it be something of love? Now, first of all, I mean, I think it's um, we are guided too much by what, what is as being what can be. Am I, am I making myself clear? It's as if what is, is the only viable possibility. I don't think so. I think we, we um, have every right to dream. I, I don't think it's actually such a utopian dream. I think we want to make different kinds of borders which would actually help um, both sides. And we can, we can conceive of that in our humanity and love and imagination, if only we could do it as well. So I think there's every reason to strive for that. I don't see why we should not believe in that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just speaking from the perspective of, of translating some of Gitanjali's earlier works um, when she lived in the 90s in Surat. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and so she was very affected by the, um, the post um, Babri Masjid demolition riots. Um, and she writes very movingly, I think, about those borders that start to spring up that are non, not nation state borders, but the borders between people. Um, and sort of the invisible borders, the partitions in your mind, the invisible partitions. Um, and in Surat, it's she, well, she doesn't say it specifically Surat, but the, the river becomes this border that's not an actual nation state border, but serves mm -hmm. to divide peoples. And it's a, it's a kind of analogous to apartheid um, or, um, or Palestine. And that kind of thing is where the borders are not just along these lines of control, but actually uh, in our minds and between us and our neighbors and so on. And so I think that it's um, that this book also is about that. Of, like I like the you know the description of Beatty's apartment 
is a good example because it's all open. There are no borders in her apartment. Mm -hmm. um, and so thinking about dismantling borders in one's own life, in one's own mind is just as important as dismantling the borders between nations and that that is an earlier and critical step to getting to anything actually large and geopolitical. And I think we end here on a very hopeful note. Um, I go back to Gitanjali when uh, you mentioned the, the northern border in the US is friendlier than the southern and we all know what colonial project making and racialization of borders can do to us and what we here are also saying from both of you borders are meant to be transcended and transgressed and crossed. So I think that's a very, very important uh, positive note that we end here with. I thank you all, um, Gitanjali and Daisy, for this fantastic dynamic conversation, very, very needed in our times. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Back to you, Lala. Thank you so much, Amrita, for moderating this conversation. And Gitanjali and Daisy, I thank you thoroughly for joining us this Saturday. And Bhakti, thank you for inviting the India Center for joining you um, this Saturday morning for us. And if you want to hear any more about the India Center's events, you can find us at the indiacenter.ucf.edu. We have both virtual and in-person events. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Thank you again. Thank it was you. really, really Thank wonderful. You, I appreciate yeah, it. Thanks, Laila. Thank you, Daisy. Mm -hmm. It was great. <laughs> Itanjali's gone, I guess. <laughs>